And we're in Colossians 1, 23 through 29. It says, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. I am glad when I suffer for you, suffer? In my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and the glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance. Everybody say assurance. One more time because you got to. Thank you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all of the wisdom that God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you to hear your word. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you that you loved us enough not just to die on a cross for us and make us reconciled with you, but that you would give us so many tools and so many ways to continue in our faith and grow in you. Father, as I speak today, would you speak through me? Would you just move me out of the way? And would you just speak, Father, for I need to hear this so, so badly today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. So a little bit of a just transparency before you all right now. Uh, I need today, and I need what's about to be spoken so badly. And I'll illustrate a little bit more of why in just a moment. But um, I'm very excited to, to be able to speak to you today. Um, if, if you're taking notes, the title for today is Nothing More, Nothing Less. Four words, and that's it. Amen? We can go ahead and have the band come back. Okay. All right. So there's a little bit more. But nothing more, nothing less. I think Caleb does that joke all the time, and it works better when he does it. We'll leave the jokes to him. That's fine. I want to tell you a story. Uh, this happened, actually, uh, what's amazing is this, this moment that I'm about to describe to you happened within like a day or two of Caleb asking if I would step in and, and speak to you all today, and of him letting me know what we'd be speaking about. So I'm at work, uh, and I've already begun my prep on this, on this, on, on today's message, and I'm at work, and I had a moment where, based on phone calls and emails, it was about midday for me, and I began to realize that it just was a really, really bad day, bad week, possible bad month. It was really not good. The team that I'm on, we've been given a very large goal that is making even the veterans worried, and I've only been there for five months, so I'm nowhere near a veteran, and the veterans are concerned, and I had a day where everything went the wrong direction. Every phone call and every email was helping me to know that I wasn't getting towards the goal. I was running almost as hard as I could in the other direction. And I had a panic moment, man. I lost it. My chest got super tight, and I couldn't breathe. I was starting to tear up, because that's super professional, right? Yeah, that's good. That's the right image at work in a new place. New guy's crying in the corner. What's up? Everything began to close in, and I began to despair really badly, and I began to freak out. There was no way that I was going to get through the day, let alone get to the next. So we'll come back to that story in a little bit. So I kind of just wanted to tease a little bit. That's where we're starting. Last week, Caleb talked about the search is over. And if you remember, we talked about the shepherd who was on the side of the hill, who was, you know, not a lot to do, no iPhones back then, nothing really to do, but just kind of staring off into space as the sheep are doing what sheep do at night, and he's just keeping watch and protecting. And in his quest, he begins to question what he's been following, he questions his systems, and we talked about last week how he finds Christ and that Christ is the ultimate answer. And so he finds Christ, and that's it. That's what we want to hold on to. And we talked about in Colossians who he is and what that means. Um, So now, I mean, the shepherd's good, right? Everything's going to be fine. For every sheep, you know, I mean, he's just going to be prosperous. Everything's going to be cool. Everything's going to be great. 
he's found Christ. There's it's the ultimate answer. Everything's going to be just fine. The shepherd is going to have no more problems because that's how it works, right? I've seen the movies. You find Christ, and then you have no more problems. Everything's cool. Everything's great. Everything's, nobody's clapping. <laughs> one, one person wooed. But it's not a, but we're not clapping. Why? It's not, is it? It's not true. It's not how it works. So what do we do? Having found the ultimate answer, are you kidding me? We found the ultimate answer. That's the answer, but we still have this crisis of faith. It makes you wonder, is it really the ultimate answer? Often when we face disappointments and struggles, when the plan that we're following doesn't work, when the system that we've been working under, the system that we've been using, when it fails, we start looking, what, what have I done wrong? Clearly, if it's not working, especially if we know it's a good system, clearly I've messed up and something is wrong and I'm off track and need to get it back on track. That's the way we do. We change our values even. We grasp desperately, trying to hold on to everything. We found God, but we're still hungry, we're still hurting, we're still not perfect, and maybe we know he's transforming us, but he, does he have to take this long? Can't he snap? He's got to be more powerful than Thanos. Not that he, okay, sorry. Sorry, my wife said not to do that, and I did it anyways. I'll apologize for that later. Colossians 1.24, Paul says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body. Paul is like the most Christian guy that's ever been except for Jesus, and he says, I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body. And there's some places where you can go see what Paul went through. I wrote a couple of them down. Beaten and imprisoned. In fact, we think that he was writing Colossians. He says at the end that he was imprisoned. I'm getting a nod from Holly. That means I got that right. Beaten and imprisoned. He got shipwrecked three times. And at least once got bitten by a snake. Come on, a snake? Really? Really? This is the guy that wrote most of the New Testament, and he's facing struggles. What? And what do we do in those moments when we're trying to find hope and meaning, to find peace, to overcome crisis? We turn to internal things. We turn to external things. Maybe we hide away. Maybe we, maybe we shrink away from our family. Maybe we shrink away from others. Maybe we hide away. Turn to external things. We try self-improvement groups. We try support groups. We try therapists, self-help books. We try to earn more, improve ourselves financially, diversify our income streams. We try to build better businesses, change jobs. Maybe if we had a better house in a better neighborhood on a better street because we got some realtors in the house that can help with that. But we got a better house in a better neighborhood. We become better parents. We strengthen our marriage. We turn to education. We try to be smarter. We try to follow the right people. We try to have the right people follow and, and, and know, notice us. We support the right things. We support the right political party, no pun intended. When all of that fails in an effort to try to prove it to ourselves or to prove it to others, we up our social media game. Get those Instagram likes, get trending on Facebook. We use that the weird thing called Snapchat that I've never figured out. We have that Twitter. Does anybody still use Twitter? Is there any Twitter? Okay, so we still got some Twitter in the house. Okay. We hide our problems from others. We withdraw. Uh, I'm good at this one. We anesthetize ourselves. Maybe we do that through substances, and there's a wide list of legal and non-legal substances that we can anesthetize ourselves away from the pain and the struggle. Turn to internet, internet arguments, video games, cell, cell phone games, hobbies, good works, the things we do at church. There's an endless list there, too. What we, start, what, we, what we do in these moments of difficulty and when we face them, has anybody faced difficulty? So what we start doing is we start trying to figure out what's wrong, and we start trying to figure out what we need to do to make it better. And if we're honest, as Christians, we say things like, my hope is built on Jesus and my hope is built on Jesus and my abilities, my growth, my spiritual capability, my humility, my ability to get it right, my ability to be right, my ability to be good, my good job, my good kids, my good marriage, my good small group, my good acts of service, my good church, because I got one. We try to do so much to try and find the peace because we've got Jesus and everything that we're trying to do to make it work. Somebody know how to make concrete? Okay, 
I used to, I would say I worked as a bricklayer, but that's actually not true. I watched the bricklayers and I made what we call the mud, the mortar that holds the bricks together. It's like concrete. It's got the same ingredients. But I made that mud and delivered the bricks and built the scaffolding and did all of that. But I made an awful lot of concrete in my day. And it's very simple. There's only three ingredients. Sand, water, and a cement. Those three things together come to be concrete. And that's all you need, just three ingredients. When Caleb and I were talking, as, as we were, he, was, he was helping me to prepare this, he told me a story, um, uh, and a, a huge thing on Caleb and Christina's heart is, is Haiti, and they've spent a lot of time in Haiti, and we know uh, there's been a lot of devastation in Haiti through the hurricanes, and Caleb said that one of the big problems that happened in Haiti, one of the reasons that the hurricanes were so devastating is that when, when, they, were, when they were building, they were building with concrete, they had water, they had the sand, or little rocks, and they had cement, but the water they were using was salt water. So they added a fourth ingredient. Had they not added the salt, the concrete would have been stronger. And I'm not, I'm not here to say that that definitely would have held out against the hurricanes, but it would have made the concrete stronger. And the weak concrete wasn't because they didn't have the right stuff there, but they had added two. Jesus and. It's a lot of those things, by the way, those, those things that I talked about, it's not that any of those things are inherently wrong, but when we're going to rely upon them to help us to become closer to Christ and closer to peace and closer to assurance, we're getting it very, very backwards. In Colossians 1.23, he says, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. So the first part of Colossians, we see this incredible good news. A God that we can't get close to because he is so very other than us. And yet, through Christ on the cross, has reconciled us completely to him. But then we get the warning a warning after the good news, don't drift away. And folks, we don't warn people away from stuff unless somebody's gone there, right? Don't drink this, don't step on this, don't touch that, don't leap off of this. We put those signs up because somebody somewhere was like, I'll drink it, I'll touch it, I'll, you know. There's a warning sign for a reason, and Paul is telling us this. And again, Paul, the most Christian guy ever, look at his life, because I just pulled out three things, there's so many things that he went through. And so what sustained him? How did he get through that? Why would he go through that? Assurance is mentioned in this passage twice, and it's actually alluded to a third time. It is the very center and essence of what we are talking about today in Colossians 1.23. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received. And again, in 27, for God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you, and this gives you assurance of sharing his glory. Hebrews 6.19 from the New American Standard Bible puts it this way. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. So we have a hope that enters within the veil. And what does the veil reference? The veil references when the Jews had the tabernacle, the physical place on earth, when they, when they built the temple, there was one space in the temple that nobody was allowed to go into because God's presence itself lived in that space. And there was a huge, thick curtain that we call the veil to separate us from that. And in Christ, when he died, by the way, it talks about the curtain being rent in two from the top to the bottom. That's the curtain that gets opened up. That's where our hope and assurance holds in that place. It's not Jesus and only Jesus. It's only Jesus. We get it backwards and we think, well, if I could just 
read my Bible more, if I could just be better in prayer, if I could just love my wife a little bit better, if I could just, if I could do these things, if I could stop those things, if I get to this, if I could achieve that, if I could become this, if I could, we try so many things because it's, And the reality is, is that I'm not going to be any better of a husband until I'm holding on to the assurance solely in Christ. And my hope and assurance isn't in being better, regardless of how worthy she is. In fact, my becoming better and assured in him is what makes it possible. It's reversed. What I do doesn't make me know the hope that I have in him. And there's, there's, I'm never going to get that right. Because if I could get it right, I wouldn't get it wrong. And here's the thing. I, I, I grew up in church. I, Jesus found me when I was seven. And I grew up in church. So why is it, do you all remember when I started this message a few moments ago? I was in a place of despair so bad I couldn't see straight. And I was crushed in despair. Almost went back to the story. It's not time for that yet. We put our trust and hope in him alone, and then the other things become possible. Uh, there's a great hymn, and I'm, gonna, I'm cheating today because I can't put it better than this. It's an old, old hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. So when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, and my good works, and the good things I did, my good theology, my good political party, my good, all the good things that I'm supposed to have. I'm sorry, I misread that. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. There's some debate on what I dare not trust the sweetest frame means, but a lot of the research that I did this week on that passage specifically refers to, I dare not trust even on the things that look like they will sustain me. I dare not lean on those things. And then, we'll get to that. In every high and stormy gale, the whelming flood, and if our strengths and abilities could get us there, then why do we find ourselves back in that place? Because we do. So let me go back into the story at work. Remember that I'm sitting there, that I'm in despair that I'm looking at the fact that I had an appointment that was supposed to be a really good appointment and I was really stoked for this person coming in and it was going to go really, really well and now it's clear that not only did they not show, show up, they're not answering the, the phone. And I'd put an awful lot of hope in them coming in because they were going to be what was going to turn my day around. Yeah, I'm having a really bad day, but at 1 o'clock, so-and-so is going to come in and it's going to be real good for, and they're not showing up and they're not answering the calls. And I, and I gotta be honest, y'all, I lost it, and I just, I was panicking, it was so much that I, would, I, didn't, I was like, I don't even know what to say to Chelsea, like, I can't even message Chelsea and be like, I'm really freaking out here, because I'm not, I'm not gonna hit the goal, I'm not gonna make the thing, and I've, I've, done, I've given it everything I've got. In a moment, I stopped, and, and I just flashed to thinking about what I'd be preaching about today. And I realized that in that moment, what was I trusting? Me. Trusting my abilities. And if my abilities were good, then uh, if I was just I just needed to I just needed to buckle up, just buck down and just push through and be a man, man up and get through it, right? Well, if that worked, then I wouldn't have been in the spot I was in, because that's what I've been doing. So in that moment, 
I just stopped. And I pulled up and I, and I read through some of the stuff that, uh, I'll read it in a moment, the Colossians hymn from the first part of Colossians. And I just stopped and I just prayed. And I was just like, Father, I, I'm so lost right now. And I can't, I need to, I need to trust in you. And I'm, I know that the Lord put me into the, the job that I have. I know that I'm there for a purpose and a reason. It's too clear. To know, I, I, that I'm where I'm supposed to be. So then he must want to sustain me. So it isn't about what I can do. And so I stopped the really bad feedback loop and just, okay, fine. My hope is in him. He is sure. I know who he is. I don't need anything more, and, I need, and there's certainly nothing less. So I put my hope in him, and I just, I don't know how to explain it. I just was like, okay, I'm going to focus on you. And I got out of the fog, and I looked over and made my next calls. By the way, fast forward to the rest of that day. The appointment didn't show. Nobody called me back to say, hey, I changed my mind, and I'm really sorry. I, I'm, I'm ready. I didn't get emails back. Hey, you know what? I, like, my day didn't get better. It didn't change the circumstances. It didn't shift. What shifted was him shifting me to remember that I'm focused on him. And if I know that I am his and he is mine, and if I know that he holds me, then that's assurance enough. And a thing isn't a thing until we make it a thing. And if, and if maybe if I'm on a track and I'm going to get fired from this job because I'm not performing, then he's there and got that too. And what's interesting is, is that all of a sudden, I was doing better. And since then, I've had more moments, by the way, where I've gone, okay, nope, got to go back to it. Well, I've been in Christ for a really long time. I've been in churches for a long time, and I'm not trying to brag that I've been doing that. I'm just saying it's, it's the opposite. How have I not, why do I have to keep coming back to this? For some of you who are new in your faith, learn how to do this early. And if you don't have faith, this is what it looks like. This is how it works. Some practical steps. How do you do it? Prayer works, reaching out to family. That's what, I mean, there's an opportunity to come up. There will be people here to pray with you. That's a step. Don't get stuck in the loop. This is just horrific feedback loop where I'm such a loser because I can't do this thing. Oh, you know what? I shouldn't call myself a loser. Man, I always call myself a loser. I'm such a loop. It's a feedback loop that's really, really bad. Putting hope in him breaks that feedback loop. Because when you take the focus off of yourselves and what you can do or can't do, what others are or aren't doing, because I've only stepped it on myself today. I haven't talked about all the people that are failing around me and how they're not helping me get where I'm supposed to be. Physically stop, breathe, think on him, focus. It's an interesting thing. Uh, drivers, when we go through driver's ed, we're taught what you're looking at and focusing on is where you're going to drive. Right? Motorcycles, you turn the whole bike with your body. Right? Motorcycle accidents happen when somebody's watching. Right? You see it on YouTube. So focus, and that's, I mean, honestly, all I did in that moment at work was I just took a moment. Now, what I was focused on was the circumstances of frustrations. I was focused on things that hadn't happened. I was focused on stuff that might happen but wasn't. And the band can go ahead and come back up. So how do you, how do we, how do you shift that to, to Christ only? How do we shift to just that assurance? Find the people around you. When struggling, I reread this. It's for the first part of Colossians. It's the hymn in Colossians. And if you need to, carry this thing around with you. Because nothing more, nothing less. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. One, Christ two, is also the head of the church, which is his body. One, he is the beginning two, supreme over all three, who rise from the dead, four. so he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself, and he made peace with everything in heaven and Intro. on earth by means of Christ's blood on earth. He's got me. 
he's got you. And to be sure, I am not going to stand here and tell you that you shouldn't want to love your husbands and your wives better. I'm not telling you that you shouldn't try to improve yourselves. I'm not here to tell you you shouldn't do the business. I'm not here to tell you that you shouldn't do all of those things. But if they're what you're putting your hope, your faith, and your assurance in, that's the salt in the concrete. And it's not going to work. Check the saltiness of your concrete. That's the thing. So our blessed assurance is in him and in him alone. All the other stuff, it's not terrible, but it's in its place. And I can't stress it enough that it's community that makes this happen. It's not the stuff that we can do. Uh, some really tragic and terrible news this week with Kate Spade, Anthony Bourdain. These are people that were at the top of their game. They were at the forefront of everything. I don't know what their relationship is with the Father. But I'm here to tell you that if, it's, if you can do it, there's examples of people who have really done it well and it wasn't enough. And I don't know how to make this message more practical. I struggled with that a little bit. Well, sort of just When you're at a place and you're hurting and you're, you can't see that next place, Look around. Because the interesting thing is, is likely the person that you're talking to is struggling also and the two of you together. Jesus said, we're two or more gathered. I am there also. So I just want to share that with you. Uh, so the good news is this. I feel kind of heavy. There's a heaviness. I want to bring it back up. So here's the good news. I'm doing better at work. Uh, and because I've been focusing on Christ a little bit better, um, like my numbers have gotten a little bit better, but I definitely find more peace. And when I find more peace and I walk in that confidence, guess what happens? My phone calls are better. My emails are smarter and more intelligent, more focused. I'm doing my job better. I'm more relaxed and I walk in a confidence and a peace because I think Jesus wants you to walk in that as well. Fair enough? Fair enough. Uh, let me just pray for us again. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for what you've spoken. Father, would you teach us how to walk in this? Father, would you help us to understand your sufficiency? Would you help us to understand that you are our assurance and that we hold on to you alone? No more Jesus and just, just Jesus. May we hold on to that.